Um, but I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, SPICE Work Package 3, which is impacts on the environment. Uh, this is some work that uh, myself uh, and Andy Jones at the Met Office have been involved with, together with uh, uh, the University of Oxford, um, University of Bristol and the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm going to talk, first of all, just to bring you back to framing the issue. Now, I'm not talking about framing in uh, a socio-economic uh, um, framework. I'm, I'm talking about more the science. Um, what do we understand about climate and climate change? And um, Matt uh, showed a, a version of this uh, a little bit earlier today. Um, but I just wanted to uh, emphasise a few things. Um, this is basically, um, as Matt described, uh, the, the global mean temperature change under a variety of different uh, scenarios. Um, and what, um, what's frequently overlooked is that um, in order to maintain uh, uh, temperature changes under the rather arbitrary 2 degree uh, C uh, threshold that's um, associated in some ways with dangerous climate change, you have to have a large amount of carbon dioxide removal uh, implicit in, in the scenarios. Um, even when you're moving up to moderate amounts of, uh, even when you're moving to a more mo moderate uh, climate scenario that uh, increases by uh, sort of around about three degrees, you, you've got a moderate amount of carbon dioxide uh, removal um, implicit in those uh, scenarios. Um, but also, I'd like to highlight this, which is uh, the business as usual, if you if you like. Or I'm going to consider this as being a business as usual <laughs> framework. Um, these are um, results from the Hadley Centre uh, model, uh, and I'm going to concentrate a little bit on. Uh, what happens when you get out at the 2090s? So by the end of the century, um, I'm, I'm talking really about my, my child's lifetime, if you like. Um, at the moment, as Matt was saying, we're actually uh, slightly worse than the RCP 8.5 scenario in terms of emissions. Um, so um, if we have a look at what... Uh, if we have a look at, uh, at what this temperature change actually is, is realised by, uh, by uh, 2090... This is what it looks like in a geographical pattern. Now, um, I would say that there's some, some very interesting things here. Look at the scale. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, results from the Hadley Centre model, which is a, a reputable climate model. Um, the ice cap's gone up by 20 degrees. OK? Bear that in mind. New York's gone up by 8. OK? The Amazon's gone up by 8. And the Amazon's obviously a sensitive area for, um, because it's really acting as, as the lungs of the planet. It's often referred to because of its ability to fo uh, photosynthesize and take up carbon dioxide. So um, this, is, this is what the, that uh, four to five degree uh, temperature increase looks like. And this is where we're heading unless we do anything. And this is what, um, um, one of the, the reasons that um, uh, geoengineering has been suggested as, as potentially uh, being a way forward. So um, what I'm going to talk about is the unintended side effects of uh, solar radiation management. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, high, high latitude weather, plant growth, ozone and precipitation. Um, but before I do that, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some work that's being done at the University of Oxford, which is whether we can, using our standard climate models, uh, model natural analogues um, like volcanic eruptions. So... Um, one of the things that uh, Simon Driscoll at the University of Oxford pointed out was that uh, climate models are not particularly good at uh, representing the dynamics after uh, eruptions from Pinatubo and El Chichon, which emitted about 15 and I think it was about 8 terograms of SO2 um, uh, in the 1980s and the, the, and the 1990s. Uh, observations um, show that you tend to get a... a a winter warming uh, in the winters subsequent to uh, volcanic eruptions. And this is due to a dipole in surface pressure that's essentially moving uh, low pressure systems uh, in from the Atlantic and they're able to penetrate further into the, into the continental regions of, of Europe and uh, Asia. If you look at how the models do at representing these uh, kind of things, they're hopeless. They don't do very well at all. Okay, there's, there's no evidence of, of penetration. Um, there's no evidence of, of a warmer, wetter winter here, um, and the, the surface pressure anomaly is, is, is incorrect. Um, so uh, this basically is, is done from an ensemble of uh, CMIT-5 models, which is a climate model into comparison um, 
uh, project. However, uh, what Simon has also done is he's improved the stratosphere, in, mainly in terms of the resolution um, and how um, aerosol is represented in the stratosphere. And once you do that, you can see that you can start to represent some of this uh, warmer, wetter winter. Um, that is, uh, that, and that's evident in December to January and, and February to March. And you're starting to represent uh, this dipole in surface pressure that uh, is, uh, is, is shown in the uh, observations. So I think with it, we need to improve our climate models. This, this one isn't one that's run as standard. This one's got an improved vertical resolution in the stratosphere. Okay, um, now moving on to actually having a look. Is the, is the cure worse than the, than the disease? I think this is um, it's a pretty uh, provocative title. Um, but I'd like to, I'd like to just, uh, just bring sort of these things to your attention. Here's... This is a, um, some idealised uh, experiments from a multi-model ensemble. I believe there was 12 models uh, participating in this. This is temperature change, which is uh, uh, under... Well, the idealised simulations, let me go back to that, is basically um, a, four, a quadrupling of, of carbon dioxide. And also the, the other experiments that are on the right-hand side are when you're balancing that quadrupling of carbon dioxide by uh, reflection of sunlight. And what you can see here, this is the temperature change under quadrupling uh, CO2, about three degrees. Globally, <coughs> everywhere, everything's happening. This is what happens, and this is the agreement between the models. Um, the, the hashed areas are, are areas where the models don't agree, but you can see that the models really do agree very well on, in terms of what um, the te residual temperature impacts. People will say, oh, look, you know, there, there's warming in the polar regions still and the cooling in the tropics. But look at the magnitude of these. These are, tend to be around the 0.5 kind of degrees, whereas up here, you're warming at 4, 5 degrees. So, you know, there is some, some residual impact, but it's rather small, OK? Have a look here as well. This is the residual precipitation impact. Um, models don't tend to agree very well, which is a point Peter Davidson was, uh, was making, but they do agree in the tropics where you do get a, a slight decrease in the precipitation. And that is slightly different to what happens uh, under uh, a, a quadrupling of, of uh, CO2. But nevertheless, these changes are, are really rather small. And I'd just like to highlight that a, a bit more by uh, doing what is not an idealised... Well, it is an idealised experiment, but it's a less idealised experiment. So this is the, art, the business as usual looking at the 2090s. So this is the, the temperature plot that I showed you before with 20 degrees happening at, at uh, polar regions. This is what happens under solar radiation management in, in the Hadley Centre model. You can see there's actually very little temperature change. It's between, basically, you know, if, it, if it's kicking around here, then um, in these light green and white colours, then you're looking at temperature changes that are order of a couple of degrees. Certainly nothing like you'll, you'll get under a business-as-usual kind of scenario. People sort of talk about the precipitation being, uh, being a, p a potential problem, but... This is the, the uh, particular precipitation pattern that, that you, you get under uh, geoengineering. And you can see, ah, well, I'd be worried if I was, I was in the Amazon. But I'll come on to show that that's, that's, not, necessarily, uh, that's not necessarily going to have as much of a, a, a detrimental impact as this one. Because you're, in the business as usual, you actually dry the Amazon in this model. But you also get this 8 degrees temperature increase. And... What happens when you, when you combine those things together? The impact on net primary productivity, which is just vegetation productivity, crops if you like, significant decrease in business as usual over the Amazon. Actually here, the, the plants love it. You're not changing the temperature very much. You're increasing the carbon dioxide. Photosynthesis is increasing, okay? And uh, so the, the uh, vegetation primary productivity, the net primary productivity goes up by about 20% on a global basis. Um, this bottom one here is just showing uh, sea ice. Uh, and it's basically showing that uh, sea ice can be maintained under these geoengineering uh, scenarios. Now, I know I'm risking, I'm at risk of sounding like a, a geoengineering zealot at the, at the moment. So I will, I will now show you some of, the, some of the problems that are associated with this. Okay, so cautionary tales. One of the things that uh, a few people have mentioned is, is whether a state may take it, take it on themselves to uh, unilaterally geoengineer. 
Um, and what we did here was we, we uh, injected uh, sulfur dioxide either into the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. And these results show uh, the change in precipitation from geoengineering the northern hemisphere. And what you see is this um, shift, if you like. Um, this is, is an area of drying. This is an area of, of moistening. It can be essentially thought of as a shift of the ITCZ, the intertropical convergence zone, which carries the monsoon rainfall down to the south. Um, and this is a would have a devastating consequence on one of the most vulnerable areas on the planet, the Sahel. Um, you could theoretically geoengineer the southern hemisphere, uh, and you can actually increase the precipitation in the Sahelian region. This is in the climate model, but a lot of the climate models will show this kind of response. And I'll just show that a, a, a little bit quicker. Here is um, uh, a business, our business as usual scenario. In this case, we were using a moderate scenario, but here we've got this, this reduction in precipitation uh, across the Sahel. And if you were, were to, were to uh, inject into the southern hemisphere, you get this very large increase in, in precipitation over the Sahel. So there's some interesting things. It, be, be wary of, of these, the, the idea that you can, you can uh, geoengineer unilaterally, if you like. There's some other very inter interesting consequences. People have said, well, why don't you do this? Why don't we make it nice in the Sahel? Well, the problem is then you get 20% more hurricanes hitting the US. It's up to you. <laughs> you, play, you pay your money, you, you take your chance. Um, okay, now here this is another, another cautionary tale. Um, here we've got, uh, a, again, it's a multi-model ensemble uh, of temperature change in the, the uh, dashed lines here. And you can see all the models are basically going up uh, predicting a, a temperature change in future climates. What we tried to do here was, was balance that um, by uh, reducing the solar constant and then letting go after 50 years. And what happens here is what's known as the termination effect. You get all your climate change occurring in five years. Now, ecosystems would really not like that. They're not just dependent on the amount of, uh, on the absolute value of temperature. They also depend very much on the rate of change of temperature and adaptation to this kind of uh, rebound effect if geoengineering were to stop for any, any time is a serious problem. Uh, technical considerations. Uh, Hugh came onto this saying that he can build his, his balloon up to uh, 20 <coughs> kilometres. This is what we've um, worked out as being the... This is a, an investigation into the opt optimal delivery altitude and latitude. So just to orientate you on the graph, this is going up from uh, 13 kilometres up to about 26 kilometres. Here's the, the equator moving outwards to the north or moving outwards to the south. And uh, what you can see is uh, we can, if, if we were injecting here, which is uh, basically uh, where Hugh reckons we, we can get to with current technology, we're not at the optimal, uh, optimal altitude, um, which would be basically higher. Um, however, you can also see that um, aircraft are really not nowhere near, commercial aircraft are really nowhere near able to uh, inject uh, at high enough altitudes. And the other problem is, of course, if you were to go this way, you'd be loading the northern hemisphere with sulfate, therefore you'd be pushing the, um, the, the monsoon down to the south. Um, alternative particles with less ozone impact. Well, titanium dioxide has, uh, has been talked about a little bit. Matt talked about this before. I'm just going to say that titanium has less impact on stratospheric ozone um, and it's, it's more efficient than sulfate aerosol uh, in terms of its, uh, its um, reflection per, map, per unit mass of, uh, of aerosol. And here's some simulations that we've done. Uh, this is Anthony Jones from the University of Exeter, who's a PhD student working with me. Business as usual, as, we, as we've sort of seen before, large increase in temperature. This is what happens when you inject sulfate, uh, where we got this small residual high uh, latitude warming cooling here. This is what happens if you inject soot. Now, soot is absorbing, and it does actually the opposite. So you've got a high latitude cooling and uh, a low latitude warming. Um, titanium, we found in these initial results that we get a, a broadly even distribution of temperature change. So there's some potential that, that uh, uh, different particles with different optical parameters can give you uh, a, a more even temperature change. Uh, the final thing I'd like to talk, to talk to you about is the impacts of direct and diffuse radiation on plant productivity. Um, really, this is uh, uh, 
the physics of what's happening here is, if you imagine direct sunlight coming into a, a, a canopy, um, all the leaves are angled in a particular direction. The, the uh, leaves that, well, basically the leaves at the edge of the canopy will shade the, the ones uh, further down in the canopy. If you can change the sunlight to be coming in from all different angles, which is what aerosols will, will tend to do, you'll tend to increase the amount of photosynthesis of the canopy as a whole. Um, and uh, that's shown um, on this sort of snapshot here. There's some areas where um, the, uh, there's been an increase in, in photosynthesis. Um, some work that Prue Foster has been doing uh, at, together with Matt at uh, the University of Bristol says that while this might happen on an instantaneous kind of basis at certain, certain areas, when we start to average this up um, to be... Uh, to monthly means, we tend to find that um, we don't actually have any benefit from, or, or the, the, the photosynthesis is not enhanced. So the, the implications are that the, that the crops will not benefit from uh, uh, solar radiation management uh, in this particular aspect, although they may benefit fr uh, from the carbon dioxide fertilization, as I've previously noted. So <clears throat> here's my conclusions. Um, I think the framing is important. It's the framing not just in, in terms of uh, social economic con uh, context, but also in terms of what happens if we don't do it? What happens if we don't do any geoengineering? What happens if we don't do any mitigation? And I think that's, that it's always very useful for us to look at things like what would, where would we be, at the, where, or where are we going, or where will we be at by the end of the century? I think um, there's certainly some benefits of a geoengineered future compared to business as usual, as I've displayed. Um, but, but there are certainly some uh, strong caveats that I would like to put in. Um, the ones which I, I've highlighted here are really unilateral stratospheric, stratospheric geoengineering could lead to a, a big change in monsoon precipitation. Uh, current technologies, people have said, puts uh, aerosol out of, out of uh, commercial aircraft would be very inefficient. You're miles away from that bullseye at high, altitu at high altitudes and uh, low latitudes. And also the termination effect um, poses a significant hazard. There's not many uh, processes uh, um, that have managed to keep going for you know, the, the, the scale of centuries in terms of engineering projects. So um, with that, I will finish. And I think uh, we'll move on. Thank you.